Hi, Brian here again, and we're back for another installment in our Going to the Source series. We're taking another look at John Smith's packing list. Last time we looked at what he recommended for clothing, and this time we're going to take a look at military equipment. So again, today, what we've got is the selection of arms and armor recommended by Captain John Smith. And of course, we know already that defensive equipment in early colonial Virginia is key. You know, the colonists come here in 1607 absolutely convinced they're going to have to fight Spain for control of the territory, which in the early 17th century is no joke. And they're also fully aware that the native population here may not be super enthused to have them as new neighbors. Uh, and so while they're hoping to get along with the natives for as long as possible, um, and as we discussed in uh, uh, one of our earlier going to the source videos, they're, they're fully expecting to end up with conflict with the natives eventually. And they, they definitely uh, meet that expectation. Uh, by the time Captain Smith authors his list, and of course what we've got here, again, we're, we're covering the, uh, uh, the military portion of a rather extensive packing list that he entitles a particular of such necessaries as either private families or single persons shall have cause to provide to go to Virginia whereby greater numbers may in part conceive better how to provide for themselves. Uh, so basically everything he recommends you bring to Virginia and last time we talked about the clothing uh, that he recommended uh, as, but today, again, we're talking about that, that military equipment, and by the time he authors this list, we're looking about 1624, at least by the time it's published, and by 1624, the colony is transitioning from Virginia Company administration to Royal administration, and they are uh, now in a second conflict with the Powhatan, Second Anglo-Powhatan War uh, has already been uh, underway for, for two years, essentially by this point. Uh, the Virginia uh, legislature has already lawfully required landowners uh, to possess uh, arms for their own defense and to aid in the defense of the colony at large. The archaeology shows just a tremendous density of military equipment in early colonial Virginia, arms and armor of a really wide variety. Uh, we've got, of course, all sorts of written descriptions talking about people in the colony kind of pulling double duty as whatever they were originally hired to do, their trades and crafts and what have you, and soldiering, um, and lots of, of sort of circumstantial references to different types of, of arms and armor in use here. So just a plethora of evidence to support nearly every type of, of, of military equipment, infantry equipment in use in Western Europe just about at the time. Uh, but then we've got conveniently this list from Captain John Smith uh, who's giving us uh, a, a nice, clear, concise, here are the things that I believe to be the most important, most effective for use in Virginia. And of course, it's by no means a standard issue. He's just making a recommendation, and there's very little in the way of standard anything in the time period. Uh, but there's definitely equipment that is typical. And when we get this reference from Captain Smith, again, it's a list of recommendations, but it's a list of recommendations that is born out of a tremendous amount of experience. As we discussed last time, you know, Smith has a lot of experience even before coming to Virginia. He's fought for the Huguenots uh, in Western Europe. He's fought in the Balkans uh, against, the, uh, against the Turks uh, and even did uh, a bit of piracy on the uh, Mediterranean before then coming to Virginia, serving several years here and then in uh, you know, a few years later also um, uh, you know, get, getting into to New England. So he's had at least two different experiences in the New World, a tremendous amount of combat experience in general, uh, both as a soldier and an officer of command. And so you know, he's, he's speaking with authority on the subject for sure. And uh, so what we've got, again, we're gonna take a little bit closer look at everything that he considers to be the most necessary and the most effective. And it's a surprisingly short list, and it starts with, as he puts it, one armor complete light. 
Now that doesn't specify a whole lot. And some of these terms, of course, get used differently over the years. So what we might think of as light armor, modern day, you know, we, we might say, oh, well, it just doesn't weigh a lot. Um, and that could be the case. And what we've got here is what is often referred to as a pikeman's corslet in the time period. But this is going to be the most common infantry armor in use in the time period. Uh, it is arguably the easiest and least expensive to produce and provides a substantial amount of protection against a lot of the conventional weapons in use in, in Eastern, or, excuse me, in Western Europe. And this is important to bear in mind. There's still not an industry that's really specifically producing arms and armor for colonial Virginia. So you've got to take equipment that has been produced for the conflicts in Europe and out of all of that, select what best suits your service here in Virginia. Um, so it might just be referring to the fact that this basic infantry armor, you're going just for core protection. If you're mass producing stuff ahead of time and it's not custom tailored, you can't get out onto the arms and legs and risk impairing movement and costing more and weighing more and all this sort of thing. You're going for just core protection, helmet and, and torso armor. Um, so, you know, the, the, the saying one armor complete light might just be a refer reference to its weight. Um, it may also just be a reference to the fact that it is basic armor. It's, it's not, you know, that, 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 that more thorough protection uh, for your extremities. It's just for your core. And it may also be a reference to the, uh, the, 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 the quality of the armor. You know, you've got different, what they'll refer to as proofs at the time. So armor of light proof uh, for service in Europe would be essentially proof against things like swords and pikes but firearms are likely to go through it, uh, and more robust hand-to-hand -hand weapons that are intended for penetrating armor may be able to go right through it. Uh, and then you've got armor of proof, which may be able to hold up to lighter caliber gunfire, give you better protection against the uh, weapons that are, the hand-to-hand -hand weapons that are intended to be armor piercing. Uh, and then you've got uh, armor of, of heavy proof or, or, or musket proof armor, which is built to be able to stop, stop just about everything. Um, and so it may be a reference to that. And you're figuring, you know, against power and arrows, stone bone tipped arrows, um, that uh, the, the light proof armor, which is going to be, you know, again, the least heavy and also the least expensive, uh, may be sufficient. So the vagueness of the, of the phrasing that he's used does leave a little bit of room for interpretation. Uh, but most likely, he is referring to some sort of pikeman's armor because, again, this is going to be the most common the most numerous, the most widely used, and the most available uh, armor in the early 17th century. Uh, now he goes on to next item on the list. Uh, one long piece, five foot and a half near musket bore. So piece being a general term for firearm in the period. And uh, what we've got here uh, is one of our matchlock muskets. Not quite five and a half, uh, feet in length, but pretty close. Um, and again, in that, that musket bore kind of range, again, things are not exactly standard in the time period. Generally speaking, in English service, they figure uh, to be considered a musket, it needs to be firing 12 bullets to the pound of lead, putting it uh, close to 75 caliber, not quite. And so something anywhere in that kind of 70 to 75 caliber range would probably make Captain Smith happy. Um, in this case, it's a match lock, but you'll notice it doesn't specify what sort of firearm. He just wants it to be a nice long barrel, so you get decent range. He wants it to be at least near musket bore, so that you've got, uh, uh, you know, again, some, some hitting power. But uh, he doesn't specify what sort of operating systems. It could be a match lock, which are probably going to be the most numerous in the early years, and certainly the, the most available, the most uh, affordable in Europe, but we also see very early uh, the fire locks, the weapons that generate their own sparks. So for the English, the early uh, flint locks called snap haunces, um, especially, but even wheel locks, uh, gaining popularity in colonial Virginia quite early. And so could be any of those operating systems as long as it's got a decently long barrel and a fairly heavy bore. And uh, of course, to go along with that, he recommends 20 pounds of powder and 60 pounds of shot or lead, pistol, and ghost shot. Now, 
20 pounds of powder. Of course, you know, here we've got our, our powder cask and um, obviously you're not going to be able to shoot much without gunpowder and there's going to be it's going to be quite a while before we see any gunpowder manufacturer of any sort and even after it kicks off any gunpowder manufacturer of any kind of meaningful volume happen in the colony so that's going to have to come with you uh, and then you need your projectiles now one of the uh, convenient things about the vast majority of the firearms in this period is that they are smooth bore just like a modern shotgun you can fire a really wide variety of ammunition out of them. And so while with this weapon, yes, we could put uh, a very near three quarter inch diameter single ball down the barrel and be able to drop just about anything. Um, we could also put, as he's putting it, you know, goose shot down the barrel. We've got references to military uh, muskets being used for fouling, especially in the fall when, when migratory waterfowl, you know, headed south down the East Coast, all getting funneled through the Chesapeake Bay. It's a fantastic food resource. Um, so you're looking at a weapon that can serve double duty for, uh, you know, hunting and fowling as well as a military arm. Plus, it's important to bear in mind that in combat with an enemy that does not habitually wear armor, you don't necessarily need that big, heavy musket ball, which is intended, amongst other things, to be able to penetrate armor. You can use, and we have references to it, we have archaeological examples of it, uh, firearms, everything from pistols to, to long arms, loaded with multiple projectiles for, uh, yeah, intended for use in combat. Um, the, you know, our, our Virginia archaeology has, has found human remains that have kind of combination loads um, still in them four centuries later. So imagine an undersized musket ball and a half a load of buckshot, uh, what we'll refer to as buck and ball, modern day. So. You know, they, they want you to have options. You could put that single musket ball down the barrel. You could put a couple of pistol bullets down the barrel. You could put a handful of goose shot down the barrel, or you could mix and match. Um, so they're saying, you know, either bring the shot or bring the lead to cast the shot. Now, this may not be exactly 60 pounds, but it's pretty close. And this is going to be important in the period as well with the weapons unstandardized. Shipping pre, uh, pre-made shot, especially if you're supplying a large number of people, may not fit everybody's firearm. So shipping blocks and bricks of lead that can be broken down and cast into whatever size shot is necessary for the various firearms in use is going to be a bit more common. So bring your, uh, bring your firearm, bring your ammunition so the firearm actually does you some good. To carry that ammunition, he specifies that you should bring a bandolier. And of course, bandolier gonna be the most common uh, means for musketeers on the battlefields of Europe to carry their ammunition. So you've got a varying number of chargers. Originals exist with anywhere from as few as six to as many as 22, though the vast majority tend to be in the kind of 10 to 15 range. Uh, but little bottles to carry a pre-measured charge of powder so that you don't have to worry about measuring in combat. Um, and this is again telling um, that he's not recommending that you bring a charging flask or a single container that you would have to measure each round out of. He's specifically recommending a bandolier, uh, which is quite practical for combat use. It helps speed up your loading on the battlefield and helps to keep things a little bit more consistent. You can imagine if you're making, trying to make finite measurements while people are trying to kill you, your measurements might not be real precise and the performance of your weapon is going to suffer if you've got varying amounts of powder going down the barrel each time you reload. So having all of that done ahead of time also aids in the consistency of your weapon's operation. And of course, vast majority of bandoliers in the time period are also used uh, in conjunction with priming flasks, priming from a separate container so that you don't disrupt the measured amount by priming with it first. And he completes his list with a sword. He says, uh, one sword, and one belt. And that's all he tells us. In modern day, we have a tendency to try to classify everything. And so we, we try to fit swords, uh, especially, uh, into very specific categories. We come up with all sorts of different things to call them. Historically, they're just not as worried about classifying things as we are today. And so in military use in general, in the early 17th century, we see a really wide variety of swords. And archaeologically in Virginia, we see a really wide variety of swords. So far, most common archaeologically, 
what we find evidence for are basket hilted swords. Now, this is still not by any means a standard type. There's a lot of different styles of basket hilt. Uh, what we've got here is a reproduction of one of the more common styles of basket hilt that have been found in Virginia so far. We see a lot of different styles of hilts. And we see a variety of different styles of blades paired with those hilts. And what we have here is what modern historians would call a basket hilted broadsword, a nice broad blade. But we also see uh, the basket hilts paired with back swords that would be single edged swords what we'll now call thrust and cut swords, which is the same kind of idea, but narrower, trying to get a balance between thrusting and cutting. But again, they're not worried about that specific typology historically. Do you have a sharp blade that you can hit somebody with? Great, you've got a sword. We don't really, uh, not as worried about what kind of sword. Um, so that's all he says, you need a sword and you need a way to carry it. And so most commonly at that time, what you're going to see is this assembly. So you've got your sword belt uh, with the hardware mounted on it to make it a little easier to carry the sword and convenient to don it quickly. You've got the hanger assembly attached to the scabbard there and that simply hooks into the belt. So nice and quick to get on and off. Uh, and so that's pretty much everything that Smith refers to on his list of equipment. The armor, the musket, the ammunition, the means of carrying the ammunition, and the sword. And that's what we see most commonly used uh, when we see the written references about combat between the English and the natives uh, is armored, mu armored musketeers. And uh, they find the armor, of course, to be exceedingly necessary against the pouch and skill with archery. They find the, arm, uh, the firearms to be tactically most effective uh, against the Powhatan, giving them greater range and hitting power as compared to the Powhatan bow. But also, especially as the colony evolves and you get fewer and fewer men from the upper classes who have grown up learning how to fight and more and more people from the common classes coming here for the chance of opportunity to, you know, get themselves, earn themselves a farm, settle down, farm tobacco, make money, what have you. Uh, you have people who are less expert as combatants and the musket is definitely gonna be the firearm at the time, or firearms in general are gonna be the weapon at the time. It's gonna be the easiest for those who do not have prior experience to learn how to use to become proficient with quickly and become effective as combatants in a hurry. A uh, matter of weeks in many cases is all that's necessary uh, to take someone with no prior military experience whatsoever uh, and make them proficient uh, with a firearm. And uh, of course, you know, when we, when we look at the, uh, for instance, the legislative requirement for people to own weaponry in Virginia, what they specify is firearms. You're not lawfully required to own armor. You're not lawfully required to have a sword. They want you to have a firearm. And so, uh, and especially as time goes on in the colony, that's we're gonna see heavier and heavier and heavier emphasis on the firearms. Uh, interestingly, when it comes to the armor, when uh, Smith gets to the portion of his list where he's talking about the military equipment, he says, arms for a man, but if half your men be armed, it is well, so all have swords and pieces. So in this case, when he's saying armed, he's talking about armor. And he says, uh, yeah, you should have armor, but if at least half of your men have armor, that's good enough, as long as everybody has a firearm and a sword. Uh, so again, that's, that's pretty telling. Um, you know, they're, they're, they want that, that offensive ability, and of course the main reason they're still so heavily relying on swords as well is there's no blade to affix to your musket yet. There's no bayonets around yet. You still need a solid hand-to-hand -hand option. And so uh, you're going to see the, the sword and musket be considered kind of a, a necessary combination. Ranged combat and close-in combat, both likely to happen. But um, that's everything that Smith considers necessary for service in Virginia, and that is the majority of what we see in the archaeology, what we see in all the other written accounts. Armor, muskets, and swords. As always, 
If you enjoyed what you saw, like and subscribe. Leave us a comment below if you have uh, if you have any questions or anything. And thanks for tuning in today. We'll catch you next time.